Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Gaming Telecom video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with NVIDIA's GTX 1660 Ti graphics card. That's right, it is not known as the 11 series, but indeed the 16 series from NVIDIA, which is, of course, based on the Turing architecture, but with the key difference of ray tracing being disabled. This particular model of the card is sporting 1536 CUDA cores, six gigabytes of memory, and well, in terms of performance then, it is meant to essentially replace the GTX 1060 and does so with the Turing TU116 graphics core. So there has been a benchmark which has popped up on the internet and it provides us a rough indication of the performance of the card versus a GTX 1060. Unfortunately, it is utilizing ashes of the singularity. So you know what the problem is with Ashes Singularity and the discrepancies with the benchmark, but even so, it does paint a fairly good picture with around 1200 points separating the 1060 versus the GTX 1660. The normal caveats would apply here, of course. It is going to be heavily price dependent, but assuming there's not much of a price difference between the 1060 and the 1660 Ti, then obviously we're going to see a rather popular GPU here. And I'd also be much happier if this uh, GPU was benchmarked with a more robust application, a more reliable uh, application, such as something like 3D Mark Firestrike. There are also reports that we will see a vanilla model of this card, so that would be the non-TI or non-TI variants, which, from what the rumors are telling us, will not support GDDR6 memory. Instead, they will either use GDDR5 or GDDR5X, so clearly the bandwidth will be cut down here. But Obviously, these cards will certainly be popular for gamers who are running at 1080p, but how much of a difference, how much of a cutback there is between the TI and the non-TI versions are not, is not yet clear. There is no exact release date yet for these GPUs. From what we can gather from both quotes from NVIDIA, along with industry insiders such as what AOBs are whispering, it would appear that NVIDIA are waiting for the inventory of cards such as the GTX 1060, 1070, and so on to completely and utterly dry up in retail. But my personal opinion is NVIDIA are making the right move to release these GPUs. I think that they are definitely facing uh, a lot of pressure from regular consumers when it comes to the pricing and the fact that Turing currently is rather expensive. Despite the fact its performance is very impressive, the cards are also very expensive as well. So for them to offer a GPU that's going to be the 250 US-ish dollar price point to maybe 300 US dollars at most is critical at this point. A new pattern that has been discovered by Kamichi, who is a well-known Twitter user. The pattern is labeled as stream processor with high bandwidth and low power vector register file. And from what we can ascertain, this builds upon the previous application that we have discussed quite at length of this channel, which was the SuperSIMD architecture. To be clear here, these GPUs are not Navi. Uh, we are referring to a GPU which is most likely going to launch in the distant future. It could be Arcturus or maybe even later with this particular pattern that we're about to discuss. So currently, AMD are using the GCN architecture, and yes, technically it's NCU with Vega, but the basic principles I'm about to say remain consistent. With Vega, for example, when you're talking about Vega 64, that refers to 64 compute units. Now, each of those compute units has a series of stream processes contained within it, or shaders if you prefer, and you can break those ALUs down into 16 times 4. Without getting super complex on this particular topic, a compute unit is really the smallest building block that you can actually create a GPU with, although obviously a single compute unit uh, based GPU would not exactly be very quick. But regardless, each of those shaders which are inside of this, or arithmetic logic units, or ALUs, whatever you want to call them, has the ability to access certain uh, resources within that compute unit. But Clearly, what has to happen here is that a scheduler needs to say, well, gosh, compute you, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, shader 32 gets to run this instruction and shader 
12 gets to run this instruction and so on and so on. And simultaneously, they cannot all access the shared resources and utilize the exact same blocks of memory and cache and so on and so on. So what we have with this updated design is the ability for those different shaders to be much better at running tasks simultaneously. With GCN, what you could have is large periods, and by large, I don't mean like two or three seconds. I, we're referring, of course, to milliseconds here at most. But you can have periods where one shader is just waiting to access a resource. So with this particular design, in theory, we have a much more efficient pipeline. And I don't like to use the term because I know it's going to get some people upset. But in theory, anyway, this could make it a more NVIDIA-like approach. And in theory, with a more robust caching system and with the general improvements we're seeing here, what we should have, once again in theory, is the ability for the GPU to be much faster and not need to keep uh, refetching data from the memory system, which should definitely improve the overall efficiency of the GPU. One of the definite ways you can see that Turing has improved, for example, over Pascal, is things such as color compression, which is definitely one area that NVIDIA have over AMD. So for AMD to do things which will reduce uh, read and write requests on main system memory and for better logic, better prediction, and just overall better caching, as well as all the other bits and pieces on the actual GPU core, we should see a much more efficient architecture, which means A, it's faster, which equal good, right? Because if you're buying a high-end GPU, you want it to be fast as possible, but it also has another major benefit and that is that you actually require less energy because it means that you know memory system requires less energy you don't need such a wider bus width and so on and so on so all of those are critical when it comes to designing a low power unit as well and once again we do not know whether this is arcturus whether Arcturus has an older variant of the design, which is more the Super SIMD, because this seems like an evolution of that. So whether AMD have just improved the patent for Arcturus, or whether we're seeing Arcturus 2.0. In other words, a GPU that is after Arcturus, which we could presume would probably not be on store shelves until like 2021, maybe even 2022. As from what my sources have told me, we're going to once again see Navi this year, 2019, around the midpoint, so May, June. And then uh, we will see a larger variant of Navi, which is going to be more powerful. We can presume that's going to be Navi 20 from earlier rumors. But either way, that is going to launch early next year. And then some other GPU, most likely Arcturus, is going to launch at the latter part of 20. Uh, 20. So AMD's roadmap in terms of GPUs appears to be very robust, but as always, we're going to have to wait and see how they perform and how their competitions such as Intel and how uh, Nvidia do respond in kind. And now we're going to finish the video off with some X570 and some B550 stuff. Some of this information has been grabbed from Gaber's Nexus, and some of it is also from a source that I have spoken with in the past. I would like to add that I'm still trying to get some clarification on a few things that I'm about to tell you, and I will also link Gamers Nexus video in the description of this particular video. So in regards to the B550 chipset, because I'm getting a lot of people who are asking me about this, supposedly we will not see a launch which is simultaneous to the X570. Instead, that could be up to one quarter later. So just a quick reminder then, that's most likely going to be at some point in Q3, maybe the latter part. And as for the Ryzen 3000 series, it would appear that we're going to be looking at the uh, first half, maybe, you know, summer basically of this year, with a possible slight delay for the X570 chipset to launch. So it's possible we may see the CPUs launch first, but it's not going to be like, you know, you have to wait six months for the board. In regards to the chipset, from what uh, Gamers Nexus has been told, uh, his sources have told him that the actual chipset is going to be less cut back compared to, uh, in comparison to Epic, and has also been told that there is a higher power requirement here. And before anyone starts to panic and maybe buy a couple of uh, 1,000 watt PSUs, don't worry, we're not 
talking anything that's going to be even slightly impactful in the grand scheme of things. To give you an idea, the chipset currently on motherboards barely takes any energies at all. We're talking way under 10 watts and most likely it's going to be around the 6 to 8. So according to what he has been told, it's going to be a slight increase, maybe 12, 14 watts. So once again, marginal at best. And as most people will say, if you've ever touched the actual cooling solution of a motherboard, it doesn't really get that hot. Like the chipset itself does not get that warm. There are a couple of exceptions that we could certainly talk about. Like if you're really hammering the IO with multiple, you know, RAID uh, SSDs and blah, 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 blah. But unless you're doing heavy overclocking, even then it's very unlikely that you're going to make that much of an impact. So power is not going to be a big thing here. I'm still trying to find out from my sources because from what I've heard, my sources kind of hinted similar to what Gamers Nexus has, but did not go into so much detail. So it's possible he didn't know so much as what uh, the source that Gamers Nexus has uh, told him, or he's still being a little cagey. So I'm trying to find out more about that, particularly now that AMD's CES event has uh, un has been and gone. Uh, I'm trying to kind of get a little more information there. I do, however, have a small update concerning the PCIe 4.0 backwards compatibility. So a quick reminder then, X570 is going to bring PCIe 4.0 as standard, but AMD themselves commented that you can actually have backwards compatibility with that an X470 board. But there is some ambiguity in exactly how this will work. What this means then is AMD are not gonna force any manufacturer, whether it's MSI or Asus or ASRock or whomever, to release an update to push this compatibility. It does appear that there is a legitimate technical reason, and that comes down to the electro electrical signaling, excuse me, and the routing of the traces on the motherboard. In a nutshell, from what I've been told, once you get past around six inches for the PCIe standard, you start to run into interference. And so what happens is, unless you've added in additional components on the board to get the longer, uh, to make the traces longer, well, basically you can start to run into instability. And so because the current generation motherboards like, you know, the X, 470s and X370s were not produced with this in mind, what could happen, in theory anyway, is that you could have a BIOS update, but, um, well, it would just cause it to crash because the actual board, in terms of the design, was not intended. And this is yet another reason, on top of the fact that uh, it is only the uh, slot which is directly connected to the CPU itself, that we will most likely not see all of the older motherboards supporting PCIe 4.0. Another small tidbit uh, from Gamers Nexus, and once again, I will link uh, his video, Steve's video, in the description of this video. But uh, from his discussions with AMD, they closely match to what my sources have said in the past, that AMD, as much as possible anyway, will be sticking to the same TDP as what we have seen in the past. So we're not gonna see like a 200 watt, and being a bit silly of course, uh, CPU from the company. So they're going to remain with the 65 watts and the 95 watts and so on as what we've currently seen in the past. With all of that said, I'm gonna run off uh, from this particular video. Hopefully, well, you've enjoyed it. Um, if you have, you know what you can do. You can click the like button and you can subscribe because, well, both of those things help the channel out immeasurably. And I'd also like to verbally thank everyone recently for all of the kind words, the sharing on social media, and just, well, the support in general. It has been absolutely fantastic. And I truly do deeply thank you for all of that because it's just, it's kind of well, weird actually, <laughs> to be uh, cited as a source for leaks and just in general. So once again, thank you very much for all of the support and the kind words. It is greatly appreciated. You can also find us, of course, on social media. You can find us on Patreon, Amazon affiliate links, and blah, 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 in the description of this video. But I wish you all a great day. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.